If there's one thing I've learned after 18 years of being museum director, if you repeat something often enough, you'll begin to hear it back. And this was a great success. People, there was a, it was an enormous feel-good moment, for, and lots of staff took part in it. So it's, you know, they, they, the word liminality or liminoid experience is sort of like Woodstock. It changes you a little bit. Well, this is our little bitty Woodstock. It may sound kind of goofy to say this, but in fact, it was extraordinary in that room. It was really wonderful. And anybody who took part in this, and we had, what, 12, something like that, staff at least, um, they're throughout the museum at all levels of the staff. Um, and so that will, that will ripple. I have no doubt about it. We're in Baltimore, very competitive market. We're in a 21st century city that's, I think, the 23rd, 22nd largest in the country. When Henry Walters died, we were the fourth largest in the country, or fourth largest city. So Baltimore has changed enormously. The National Gallery didn't exist when the Walters Art Museum opened. So for us to compete, for us to have an identity, for us to sustain ourselves, we need to be a citizen of the world as well as a citizen of Baltimore. This notion of a hackathon came from one person, and this one person has been involved with the museum for as long almost as I have. And he said, you have something called Art Blooms, where people in, in, in various horticulture societies will come and arrange flowers in response to works of art. He said, you should have Art Bytes, B-Y-T-E-S, in order that you can invite technology folks in to respond to specific works of art. That's how it sort of began, and I thought this was the most wonderful idea I've ever heard. And um, then we got into the, to the reality of it. Now, the intent of this was not to create ideas so much, but to engage an audience, namely a, a very um, vibrant technology creative community in Baltimore. So then we became acquainted with really the rules by which these people play. And the rules are rules that they set and we do not. Well, a hackathon is an idea that it comes from uh, sort of the tech sector of the world where uh, if, if I'm a programmer and I'm co I've come upon a problem that I can't solve all by myself, uh, I will sort of aggregate the problem to my friends or my colleagues and say, uh, please come help me do this. Uh, let's 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 define the problem. Let's let's work on possible solutions to it. Uh, and and generally, this is done in a very rapid way uh, because it's it's your friends are volunteering uh, or they're from out of town. Uh, so you say, you know, let's let's. I need this problem solved by Monday. Uh, what are you doing Saturday and Sunday? Uh, and so you just sort of hack on it and see how far you can get. Uh, by the end. It's, it's not often or always about getting a completely perfect solution. It's about, uh, about tinkering with ways that might fix it. Sometimes you luck out and you've got a final product. Other times you've got several prototypes and the next step is to figure out what's then. The way it took form was, uh, in, in true hackathon fashion, it was, let's hurry up and do this. If we overthink it, we'll kill it. Um, very quickly now, let's reach out to the tech community locally and, and beyond to see if there's any interest. Um, they know what a hackathon is, so the only people we really have to explain hackathon to is, is ourselves, and, and maybe to the press, uh, but to the, to, to the audience where after they know what that is. And they're going to be delighted. Hackathon at a museum? Weird. What's that going to be like? Uh, so, so we had that, that, that sort of novelty to it. But also the sort of, oh, the museum wants to, wants to muck around with uh, computers and, and that sort of thing. All right, let's help these guys. They, they could obviously use the help. <laughs> My role as director was really to encourage the staff to, to approach this in a way that was kind of different from almost anything we do. You know, we plan exhibitions four years out. They cost $800,000. And every I is dotted and every T is crossed and all the legal things are just right. And what we miss in that equation uh, is just spontaneity and just seeing what's going to happen.
I mean, details like, can we stay open until 12 o'clock? Details like, are they going to bump into the statuary? Details like, um, what the food should be. I mean, all of this, we just had to kind of just let it go, and it's not the way we usually do our work. How can we learn from that decision-making process? How can we learn from that opening up? How can we learn from the people that we invited in to not only do things like this, but to do everything we do a little differently? Um, you know, rapid prototyping, just experimenting, is something that's really hard in museums. We're doing a little bit of this in our exhibition program. In other words, we'll take a big thought, consent it to a little space, uh, interview our visitors, and get a sense of where their heads are in response to it. Um, but, but that's a work in progress, and I think we've got, you know, like everything in this, in this museum world that we live in, if you see it, you know it. Once you've seen it and you know it, then you have something against which to measure what you're doing the next time. I thought the staff was kind of wonderful to watch because they were taking on the concerns that you think the director would have, namely the physical safety of the works of art, uh, the tasking. The whole idea was, and, and I think some of the, we had about four or five staff members at this committee meeting when we finally, you know, essentially pulled the trigger on this project. Oh, what's going to happen? We can't stay up. We can't keep the museum open at night. How are we going to have security? Are people going to come and go? How are we going to wire the space? And, but mostly it, was, it went sort of this way. Well, um, we should identify what needs solving. And, you know, I think it was pretty obvious once we thought about it a little bit. To get people that are that smart to work that hard, to enter a kind of collegial competition, they have to decide what the ground rules are. We had to give that up. Well, I think there still is um, a pretty strong attitude, culture, point of view in the museum community that, that to give up is to abrogate your obligation to provide expertise. Um, and of course, there are a lot of experts in museums. So what are they going to do? Do they become less experts? It was sort of funny to watch, or almost joyful to watch, actually. One of our really terrific curators advocating for the interpretation of a specific work of art to these, to these tech folks. And they didn't want to do it. You know, that wasn't what they were there for. <laughs> so you were right on the boundary between a very traditionalist but hugely creative curatorial voice and the new world, you know, and you wouldn't want to give up that territory, but how can you have them both? The hackathon model, that sort of rapid prototyping, that, that insanely collaborative and frenzied way of working has a lot more in common with museum work than we might have already known. Uh, we, we are in intensely collaborative here at the Walters. Everything we do is on a team. Uh, and so the changes I've seen uh, working here since then have not been about making new teams or thinking that you know, teamsmanship is the way to go because we already, we already did that, but it's the way that people will sort of bounce ideas more, more readily, I think. Um, it's to say, well, that's just an idea. I'm not afraid of it being you know, disproven and having the disproof of that be harmful, let's just try it out. Uh, so I'm seeing a little bit more brainstorming, I think. Um, and and a, an increased sense of, of uh, well, what does the public think? Uh, can we try it out on them? Can we, you know, I realize this thing's due next week, but is there, can we just get somebody, can we call somebody, can we just get a stranger and throw this at them and see what they say? The key moment for me, in this event was probably Saturday when the groups had divided up into their project areas and were just working with such intensity, such passion that, that, that there was an energy in the air. It's very strange to describe that, but it reminds me of the first time I went to Peabody Conservatory 
late at night. They have practice rooms that are open until like two or four. So you can hear a trumpet down the hallway at two in the morning. Or the Maryland Institute College of Art where they have to reserve the bronze casting machine for four in the morning. And I mean, that's absolute passion. Time just kind of, it's that, it's that boundary of, of uh, between a sense of uh, challenge and being fully engaged. The one disappointment I had, and I'm not sure how to address it really, that if you begin with the basic premise that we're a, a public institution, that our public spaces are sort of like parks, that, that I would have wished that we could have done better at bringing more museum professionals from other places, or people that just love museums. But Baltimore, I don't think is so unusual, that we exist in silos. And, and, um, and I wish, I hope the next time that we succeed better or succeed actually at breaking down some of those silos. I think inviting people from other museums to be judges, to be part of the organization, we tried that. And we also had a neutral third party that was a respected neutral third party as the voice and face of the project. But, you know, it was a novel project. And because it was novel, it got some attention. So maybe next time it's somewhere else. Uh, maybe next time uh, somebody else drives the agenda. But, uh, but I think we can and should do better at that. I think that's something that Baltimore needs to do better.